Well, welcome everyone to uh, a session that I think has one of the best titles we've done in quite a long time, which is, wait, who decided I was in charge? Uh, I am executive director here at TSPA. My name is Charlotte Wilner, and um, I often ask this question, who decided I was in charge? I guess it's me here. Uh, and today we're going to be talking with uh, four people in uh, leadership and trust and safety about their journeys. Um, just a little bit before we get into it about, wait a minute, what is TSPA? Uh, TSPA is the Trust and Safety Professional Association. We're a nonprofit that supports people who work in online trust and safety, um, whether you're an individual or a team. If you do the work of online trust and safety, we are an organization for you. Um, we are really excited to be presenting this session because I think a question that a lot of people have as they progress through their careers in trust and safety is, what does it mean to be a leader? Um, am, am I a leader? Can I become a leader? Am I a leader, but what if I'm not a good one, right? There's all these questions that I think we have as we progress through the field. And um, we're really excited to be sitting down and asking some questions to four beloved leaders in the field today. Um, before I have them intro you, I'm just going to remind you of some quick, uh, before I have them intro you, before I have them intro themselves, um, just quick uh, housekeeping here. We do have a Q&A box here. If you go down to the bottom of your Zoom, uh, you will be able to answer questions. You can answer, you can ask, answer questions. Folks, I got to have a second cup of coffee here. Um, you'll be able to ask questions and uh, you can ask anonymously or you can ask with your name. We will do our very best to answer them in session, uh, whether that's live or in the chat. Um, and worst case, uh, we'll be able to follow up with you perhaps. So with that, um, I would love to have our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, Catherine, maybe we could get started with you. Sure thing. Hi, I'm Catherine Weems. Uh, she, her pronouns, um, and happy Lesbian Visibility Week to everyone who celebrates. I sure do. Um, I've been doing trust and safety work since about 2000, um, and um, I've been people managing since the end of 2002. I've worked at uh, Yahoo, Google, Dropbox, Twitter. You may have heard of some or all of those companies, um, and I'm currently doing some consulting while I'm in between roles. Um, I pride myself on being an authentic and approachable leader, and I try not to take myself or life too seriously, even though sometimes the work we do requires a little bit more seriousness. Um, and I try and function as an umbrella for my team to protect them um, from nonsense from above and try and include them, though, so that there's diversity of thought um, in conversations or decisions. Um, and I love people management most days. There's definitely those days that you're like, why on earth did I sign up for this? Um, and I think I've developed some skills and experience over the years to be an OK manager or leader most of the time. But if you've worked for me previously, feel free to <laughs> tell me if that's not true. Um, and also, I apologize if you hear anything that you've already heard. So I'll turn it over to whoever's next. How about Juliet? Sure. Hello. Thanks for having me today. My name is Juliet Shen. My pronouns are she, her, they. I'm currently a director of product management at Grindr, hence my lovely, colorful background. Uh, so I've been in the trust and safety space for close to a decade, uh, mostly focusing on kind of the product side. So when I first started my career in tech, uh, which is actually kind of my second one and a half career, um, there weren't any product jobs really uh, available for trust and safety. So my background is actually in politics, sociology, it's what I studied in school, uh, and I was really involved in community organizing and nonprofit activism. Um, I kind of saw tech as another vehicle to kind of like work within the machine to advocate for underrepresented and or marginalized communities. And that's kind of how I found myself in trust and safety. So I did start off in operations, customer experience, customer support, uh, but ultimately I was driven by a sense of like, well, you know, we're using these tools, we're, you know, using these features, like people to report them, but like, there's not really a lot of like people invested in this on the product side, like full time. So along my career, I kind of created my own job along the way. Um, so in my career, I've worked at smaller startups, uh, as well as Tinder, Snapchat, and now at Grindr. I do a lot of volunteering and mentorship in my free time as well, just because I'm a very firm believer, both in that a rising tide lifts all ships. And also, if you go through a door, you better bring everyone else with you. Um, I find I have definitely found in my career that product management tends to be the most uh, gatekeepy of the various teams within tech. So it's become my personal mission to kind of like break those gates down. 
the kind of leader that I am is I try to be very empathetic. You know, I try to approach everyone. I always start my one-on-ones with like, how are you doing as a person? You know, I think that's important for all types of people management, but for trust and safety, that's especially, especially critical because of the work and kind of like the things that we kind of experience as we go through our work. I'm really excited to be here and talk a little bit about, you know, what I think about leadership. Awesome. Uh, Paul, let's have you go next. Those were so great. Um, I, I, I really appreciate the, this this panel. Um, hi, I'm Paul. I have uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm probably, we're counting careers, I'm probably in my third career now, give or take. I've been in tech for about 20 years. Um, I think about 20 years at this point. Uh, I've led trust and safety teams at some of the most well-known platforms uh, in the gaming um, industry in the world. I'm currently um, at Electronic Arts, where I'm the director of safe and fair player experiences. I lead a nimble team of product managers, that means small, uh, uh, working on EA strategy for ensuring players have safe, fair, and welcoming experiences. That's sort of a personal um, uh, commitment of mine is to make sure that people always feel like they have a place where they can be um, and just be themselves and find their peeps. Uh, prior to EA, I was at um, Riot Games and uh, at Xbox before that, leading similar sorts of teams. I've worked across a lot of different disciplines and with a lot of different people. And I've been a, a people manager leader for most of that 20 years, give or take. So I have thoughts. Um, I'll share uh, and we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and finally, Rolando. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, hi, all. Rolando Vega here, uh, pronouns he, him. Um, I've been in trust and safety about a decade now, I would say. Um, and I started my trust and safety career at Twitter. I was kind of part of their legal policy team, um, have uh, had a background in legal support, and um, kind of transitioned into this like trust and safety legal operations realm, which is really exciting. And if you don't know what like the legal compliance TNS side is, it's basically all the law enforcement requests, the IP operations requests, uh, privacy requests, all that fun stuff. Um, and yeah, I've been at companies where I built out teams like uh, Snap, TikTok, Pinterest, and now most recently at Discord, uh, leading their legal response team. Um, very similar to like what folks already said in this amazing panel. Um, as a leader, definitely have that empathy piece, I, I would say. Uh, like to kind of listen to my folks and kind of be that unblocker and support for them, given the sensitive work that we all do in this space. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here and share my thoughts and be a part of, of this amazing panel. So thank you. Well, I am so excited to get the conversation going because this is a great panel. Um, the first question I have uh, is about sort of who your role models are and have been. Um, you know, I know when I started in trust and safety, there there weren't a lot of people out there who had already been doing it for, you know, but Paul, you said like, oh, I've been doing it for 20 years. And I sat here doing the math like, wow, you know, like that's that's almost 20 years feels like a long time. And also like it's almost as long as I've been in the field. And I remember in those early days, there just weren't a lot of people who were like, I've already been doing this and I'm clearly like this mentor figure for you. And I mean, I think that must've been true for a lot of you, you know, given when you entered the field as well. So who did you sort of look to as inspiration when it came to what does leadership look like or what can it look like for trust and safety? And you know, maybe how that, how has that changed over time? Who do you look to now for that motivation, that inspiration? So I can maybe start us off. Um, so I think, so I've always been really fascinated by the internet. You know, I wrote my college senior thesis about how Asian Americans use internet platforms like YouTube to kind of like build themselves a voice in the world where so, for many, many decades, we were kind of like underrepresented, did not really have a voice, especially in pop culture. Uh, and so one of the first jobs that I took out of college was actually at this nonprofit called 18 Million Rising. And the executive director at the time, uh, Samala, uh, was one of the best mentors that I could have had. You know, I think that she really showed me how you can kind of uh, leverage business and capitalism, essentially, to kind of like convey all the advocacy and all the important community organizing, community work that we can do. And that's kind of been a mission that's kind of like showed me how leadership, especially working within the private sector, within the tech field, in a in a field like trust and safety, which kind of often blurs the lines a little bit in terms of just like pure revenue, pure growth, how do we kind of like bridge those things together, which kind of uh, has become a constant theme of my career too, is like how do we 
advocate for trust and safety within these companies? How do we evangelize it, get senior management on board with it? So some of the other um, mentors that I've had in my life are also, you know, one of my first managers, or actually both of my first managers at SNAP uh, were very, very like strong, capable, incredibly talented women who really showed me kind of like how to represent themselves in tech as well. And also showcase how a lot of these kind of like quote unquote like soft skills um, are so crit critical for trust and safety and how we can kind of leverage them into relationship building and how that kind of leadership shows that like softness is strength, you know, empathy is strength, kindness is strength, and how we can use that to foster more resiliency on our team and also drive that business impact, which keeps our organization funded and gets us a little bit more headcount. Um, some of the other folks that I look for inspiration from, especially earlier in my career, are, you know, a select number of elected officials. Um, despite being in the public sector, no one elected me to be here. Uh, I really do believe that, you know, trust and safety speaks for the people. We fight for the users. We fight for people who may not have an opportunity to represent themselves within the inner workings of a tech company. And if we have a seat at that table, we're able to kind of be that frontline response and relay what people are feeling, the pains and struggles that they're facing into things like product roadmaps, into things like annual plannings, objectives, and key results. Um, I'll stop talking and let others kind of chime in as well. <laughs> one thing, yeah, one thing I wanted to say, so as when I got into the field, trust and safety wasn't, it wasn't called cool, trust and safety. We were doing trust and safety work, but that was, you know, it was too long ago. Um, and so from a management or leadership perspective, the group of people that were people managing at Yahoo when I started were all people that actually were managing because they liked people management, wanted to get into people management. They cared about people. They wanted to help them with their careers. They wanted to help their teams be successful. Um, and I think the reason for this was um, Yahoo had was, was the internet kind of back in those days. And they had made anyone who was at the company at that time was able to have made somewhat reasonable amounts of money and so people didn't need to get into people management just for the promotion or just for the extra money right. they only did it if they wanted to do it and so it was one of the best groups of managers collectively that I've ever experienced and that was right at the beginning of my career I've worked with many many managers that have been phenomenal um what you know within my management group or within you know people I've I've managed people that have managed me um but that group of people was just remarkable because they were doing it for the right reason um and so that that was that was very inspirational initially that's actually a great seg into one of the questions I know we have coming up next here, which is about just, just the differences between leadership and management. And Catherine, I have actually never heard of that system, and I wish that system had been in place so many places because what, what a revelation having people, only people right. who want to manage be managers. Mm -hmm. And that's actually often not how people find themselves in that role. Um, and I think there's like a, a vice versa effect where there's a lot of people who are really interested in being managers and there's just not that opportunity available in their organization because it's very flat or because they're very small or because there's a headcount restriction or whatever it is. Um, so I wonder, you know, could you talk to us um, about how you engaged in leadership maybe before you were a manager? And I know there's a number of people on this panel where that's true, um, you know, I think actually, Rolando and Paul, you had this experience. Catherine, I think you had this experience. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you you were able to sort of explore your leadership style and sort of exercise leadership even when you were not a manager? I'll kick this off. <laughs> um, Go for it. Yeah, I, I'd say early on in my career, um, like others, I was definitely doing like ops and doing more of the IC kind of role. Um, but I definitely kind of took it upon myself to to start mentoring others, right? Like as far as like sharing kind of as I became a subject matter expert, sharing that knowledge with others um, and taking that mentor leader, like kind of leadership role at that point, while not directly people managing them necessarily, but still kind of just sharing that insight with them and helping up level them in a way. Um, also, I'd say um, participating in meetings, right, where you're in meetings with leadership and senior leadership, um, sometimes kind of giving your input. And a lot of times I'd be the individual kind of going against the grain, uh, which some of my previous managers might 
you know, <laughs> think, think, oh, Rolanda's in this meeting again. But again, I think it caused like for healthy debate, right? Where it's like not necessarily going with the flow and kind of giving a different perspective. Um, so I think that, that taught me a lot, right? As far as, as leadership and, and getting into that role, like questioning things, right? Um, I'd say that's kind of the initially kind of how I started getting to leadership before actually getting the title and the role itself. Yeah, I love that. I think like for me, um, my sort of means of demonstrating leadership was both trying to to model or to to demonstrate to others about how to engage and how to be sort of appropriately focused on the right things. I was also trying to understand what were the problems that my leaders were facing and how can I help them solve those problems? I, I used to tell people that my my job description was other duties as required. It was pretty much like, tell me what the problems are and kind of point me in the right direction and I'll go try to solve those problems for you. So in, in that way, I was I was really looking for ways that I could both kind of do the thing that I was hired to do, whatever that was, and also um, sort of expand my knowledge, expand my um, flexibility, um, my my uh, contribution to the to the team or the org or the company in whatever way I could. Um, and and for me, that was a a really effective way to to kind of show that I was committed to show others that. You know, just because you're hired to do this one thing doesn't mean you have to live in that one space. When you start to expand out and are aware of all of the things that are happening around you, adjacent, connected, you're more valuable both to yourself from a long-term sort of career development standpoint, as well as to the to the company. And then opportunities um, will come out of that. And just on, um, I think a lot of what Paul said, but um, figuring out how to best help my boss so that to take things off his plate and make his life easier, that's definitely a key thing. Because then, first of all, if there's ever a time where they're not available um, and they need someone to step in, they're going to look to you more and you can have that like interim leadership position potentially. Um, and then also just be conscious of how I was showing up in the workplace for those cross-functional relationships or in, in general, just so that people could, other people could see that I may have leadership potential. Um, and then some of the specific things of just making sure that you're helping onboard newer or more junior members, making sure that you're pointing them to the right documentation and um, and just like stepping up and, and like figuring out offering to lead projects, um, those kinds of things, like more, more tactical side of things that I think those things helped as well. Yeah, and if I can also just kind of add on to, I think that, you know, a lot of people can show leadership, you don't have to be a people manager to show it. Um, and actually, this is a huge part of how I ended up my current career as a product manager leader, is when I was at Tinder, you know, like, there wasn't necessarily that feedback loop between the people who are using a lot of these internal tools, and some of the teams that were actually building it. So I, like Rolando, I kind of just started showing up to meetings, uh, with a list of requirements and a list of demands and a list of bugs. And I didn't know at the time that that was actually kind of what product managers do uh, but it ended up working out because they were hungry for the feedback and that kind of showed leadership too and as Catherine said it's kind of like who valid to you know your boss but then also to your team and the pain points that they're choosing to or not choosing that they're experiencing as well where it's like if you can make yourself irre irreplaceable if you make yourself the point person to be like oh you know what Juliet's a go-to person if I have any question about x y or z um, and also taking that initiative to like read a lot of documentation so you can be that knowledgeable expert and answer questions in a really timely way. That proves value to a lot of people and shows a lot of leadership and initiative. Following up on this, I think there's a question in here around what do you consider skills that good trust, good leaders in trust and safety need to have. And I think there's like a general sense of like, what skills should good leaders have? And those obviously translate to trust and safety. So I think the way I'd phrase this question perhaps to you all is, you know, what are, what's an example of a skill that you think good leaders in trust and safety specifically need to have that, you know, it might not be something you, you have to have in all kinds of business leaders, but like is perhaps essential for folks to develop if they want to be a leader in trust and safety. Should I go? Yeah, go. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I can I think, also just call on you if that's easier. You were all yeah, so just, polite. We're all being polite. Yeah. Like, I'm jumping in. I got something. You know? We're not normally this polite, I'm sure. Um, I think adaptability, just because you never know what's going to be coming your way at any moment because it's trust and safety and it's just it's so dynamic and everything's moving so fast in almost all of the companies that we work with, work for. Um, and then resilience is obviously key as well because of the type of work that we're doing and seeing the underbelly of, of society. Um, and then, th so those are my top two, I think, for trust and safety specifically. And then I don't know if these, uh, like, I think humility is key. Um, curiosity, decisiveness, like some people in trust and safety want to debate things for forever. And sometimes you don't have often, many times you don't have forever, you have three minutes. Um, and so like, you have to be able to be decisive, but you have to be humble enough that you're willing to listen to other opinions first um, and try and have as many as possible, be curious about seeking them out. And so I think, I mean, those are some skills that are good in leadership in general, but I think specifically to trust and safety that the, the, those are key, but adaptability and resilience I would go with, but I would love to hear other people. Yeah, so mine are probably, they're definitely intertwined, but it's kind of like healthy compartmentalization and code switching. Um, I think that especially my role, you know, leading a product organization for trust and safety, knowing kind of like what resonates with people, you know, like is this a conversation or a meeting where I need to be very mission focused, very values focused, talk about, you know, the person behind the number, or is it, you know, like how do I connect this to the business impact? You know, like, is this going to, you know, like reduce revenue loss? Is this going to lead to long-term user retention? Being able to kind of like translate the core fundamentals of trust and safety into ways that, you know, others in the tech company, others in the business really understand and matter to them. Um, I kind of joke about being like a lobbyist for trust and safety internally. And that's a lot of the job is just like switching the code, speaking different languages to different people, but making sure that kind of like adding this buffer of like, okay, I have to firefight and like make sure that I'm totally on for this. But also thinking of that like five, 10 year view of like, how do I make sure that I'm planting the right seeds with the right people at the right time to get us where we need to be? Yeah, just to add to that, plus one to like what Catherine and Juliet said. Um, but also I'd say like the empathy piece is a big one too for trust and safety leaders, right? Just given the sensitive content that our teams tend to deal with, um, you're going to be hit with like hard issues, obviously. And, and you need kind of a leader that's able to kind of deal with those really sensitive kind of issues and be able to kind of lead the team through that, I think goes a long way. And, you know, great leaders I've had are able to do that. And, you know, I learn a lot from them in doing so. Um, and also, yeah, kind of what Juliet was talking about as far as like the advocacy piece, um, kind of securing those resources for your teams, right, to, to be efficient and do the jobs. It goes a long way. And we all work with cross-functional partners. So someone that's able to advocate and communicate that well uh, goes a long way for leaders in this space. The, the only thing I would add to all of the, those are all great. They're all sort of on my mental list is clarity. It's the ability to be simple and straightforward when you're communicating. And Rolanda, you kind of um, referred to that a little bit. You, you don't win when you've dazzled everybody with your polysyllabic abstruseness, right? You want to you wanna try to be as, as clear as you can be and concise as you can be, because that helps people kind of understand like where you are and where you're going. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, Rolanda, I want to follow up on something you just mentioned uh, around empathy and just the difficulty of the work. I think this is something that everyone, um, you know, in trust and safety, whether you are a manager or not, whether you are, consider yourself a leadership role or not, this is something that ends up being part of your reality. Um, and see, so recently there's been a shift in, in thinking about leadership that parallels the growing recognition of trauma in, in life, frankly, with the pandemic, I think was a big eye-opener for us um, in life and, and then in the workplace and how it impacts our individuals and our teams and sort of the, the team as a body of individuals. Um, what are your thoughts around trauma-informed leadership? How have you seen that sort of change over your time in, in being in trust and safety? And um, you know, what's your own approach to that? How do you best support a team whose job it is to, you know, like you, you as the leader are leading them into a dangerous situation, right? And you, you know that waking up every day in that job. How do you sort of think through that? Yeah, no, great question. Um, I'm all for wellness and uh, trauma-informed training for leaders. I think it's kind of pivotal and kind of something that's needed, especially in this trust and safety space. 
Um, and again, I think it provides kind of leaders the resources needed, right, as far as knowing what signals to look out for, right, when folks are are dealing with this kind of traumatic, post-traumatic kind of uh, review of content. Um, and again, I, I feel like it prepares us to, to set resources in place, provide, um, you know, certain avenues for individuals to have outlets um, to deal with kind of reviewing that type of content. Um, but again, I want to kind of emphasize that as leaders, you know, we're not trained medical professionals, right, where we can make that diagnosis or determination. But I think the whole, you know, trauma-informed leadership training, what it does is, is give you the ability to kind of see potentially those signals and offer that support to team members and those resources so they can then get possibly the, the help and support they need, right? And I think as leaders, that's kind of what we serve. And, you know, a lot of times as managers, leaders, we want to be able to solve the problem. And if someone is dealing with something serious in, in that nature, we want to be able to solve it. But a lot of times, unfortunately, with this type of, of traumatic kind of experience, like we're, we're not able to do that. And all we can do is really kind of provide guidance and support to, to get them what the actual support they really tend to need. I think that just to kind of build on that, the, I mean, the empathy piece and the being aware of the work that these teams do is vital. If you've come up through trust and safety as an IC, then you obviously know firsthand, but there are now managers of trust and safety teams who haven't done the work firsthand. And so it's really, I would say on them to really educate themselves, not to traumatize themselves in order to be able to lead, but to actually educate themselves about the work. Um, I think that it used to be that people used to ask me like what the worst thing was I'd seen on the internet. And I don't get that question anymore because I think people are more aware of trust and safety and of the, you know, the, the bad stuff that's out there. Um, but I don't think there's yet a solid understanding of how harrowing and like taxing this work can be. And this is work that, I mean, the, the work that some of our teams do would literally get you arrested in other contexts. Right. So it's like, it's a very weird, like as Charlotte said, leading you into danger. Um, and it can weigh on your conscience when you're like hiring people to look at the, the this awful content. Content. Um, and so what, when you when I hire for this, I'm trying to look at people who are able to speak up when they are having issues, because then hopefully they would speak up if this was a problem. And I tell everyone, some of my old team members are on the call, I think, but and they'll have heard this, but I want everyone to leave the job as at least as mentally healthy as they came in and I tell them that in their first week when they're just they just started a new job but I'm talking about when they leave it um because I, d I don't want the job to damage people and there's some people that can do it without the damage and some people can't and it's and it's in this environment especially this job search this job market right now it's hard to walk away from a job because of emotional damage or mental wellness um aspects even if that's the right thing for you um and so trying to have some kind of exit packages at, co at companies for this type of work I think is something that we should all probably try and start um, formalizing more um, and try and like set to, to help and also to make sure that as a leader you're that you're um, modeling the behavior and that you maybe you're going to the wellness sessions so that people see that it's not a sign of weakness or that they won't get promoted if they speak up about having issues with some kind of content because it's it's fine if you don't but it's also fine if you do it's it's quite common for you to have some some concerns so that's some of what I would add there yeah and I would also add you know my personal opinion of trauma-informed leadership is it's necessary that's non-negotiable um and I think especially you know working at Grinder, we are a very offensively queer community I identify as a queer woman and I think that you know having a team that does represent people from different backgrounds both you know across the different demographics it's more important than ever. You know, I think that behind every person who's doing this job is a person who's gone through trauma, a person who's gone through different life experiences. And that trauma can show up in their work in sometimes expected or unexpected ways. So I think being informed, knowing that there that people have lived a life, you know, before this job and during this job is really important to kind of talk to them, create safe spaces, and when appropriate, try to figure out like, you know, are there certain areas or certain topics that maybe this person doesn't want to work on? Uh, and they don't have to go into detail, but just like making sure that they have this kind of like comfort and space to say, these are my boundaries. This is a boundary I'm not willing to cross and respecting and enforcing those boundaries. And I think also as a leader who's, you know, able to kind of inform, you know, business contracts or vendor negotiations, this is also something that I think about a lot too, is like not only the people who are employed full-time at these companies and teams, yeah, but that scaled vendor teams as well, making right. sure that they're incorporating like wellness requirements, 
that not only meet kind of like the vendor requirements, but like our own um, standards and thresholds too. And then making sure that there's that like a very, very clear, very close feedback loop and relationship. Uh, this is more of the operations field, but you know, I think on product, like it's something that like I can also help advocate for too, from the kind of like the more business side as well, is making sure it's like, how do we build wellness into the features? How do we build, you know, things into the roadmap so that we are taking this trauma-informed leadership and actually kind of like trickling it throughout the entire cross-functional trust and safety team. I have one counter thought, if I may. Um, um, those are all great, great points. And I, there was something that Catherine said that I wanted to kind of come back to and, and reflect back. There are a lot of people that are in leadership or management positions who have come up through um, trust and safety space doing moderation, whatever. There are others that have come in and haven't really done the work themselves, um, but are, are leading teams like that. There is a trap that you can fall into, especially if you've come up through it, where you've developed your thick skin. And so it's harder to be empathetic to somebody else who's responding to a thing in a way that you don't respond to. And that kind of comes back to having that empathy, having that open mindset and knowing that, you know, we all bring our own luggage with us to work. And this thing that somebody may be having an issue with may not be a problem for you, but that's still their real lived experience. And you need to honor that and you need to create process and structure and, and relationships, um, the opportunity for relationships so that you can find those things. Be aware that, you know, just because somebody's not seeing something in the way you are doesn't mean it's not authentic and you can't provide some level of support. That's a great point. And I'm reminded, I have a question sort of related to this. I'm reminded of a study I was reading about a few years ago now where um, they, and of course, can I, can I give a citation? I can't, right? It's just in the memory hole. But the gist of it was this, it was where, um, you know, they had two cohorts and they were, of, of, you know, people looking at graphic content. And um, one cohort was looking at like incredibly graphic, disturbing content 100% of the time. And the other one was looking at like mostly sort of mundane content. And every now and again would get a piece of very graphic content. And the question was sort of like, who's going to be more stressed out? And I think a lot of us were like, well, clearly, you know, the people who do this all day, every day. And no, it was the people who unexpectedly encountered something graphic. Um, and I, I think yeah. about that study a lot not just in terms of like how you set up your cues and sort of those operational choices, but also about like actually how you lead your team. Because I think there's sort of this, this meta um, like takeaway where it's like, oh, you know, if you know what you're getting yourself into every day, that's a different situation than like, right. it might be fine, but suddenly it's not. And I feel like trust and safety, it's a suddenly it's not okay kind of job, right? Like we were talking about adaptability and you never know what you're going to come into. And I think a lot of a leader's job in trust and safety is helping their teams and their, their sort of communities in the job navigate that shift in focus, which is, if anything, the most consistent thing about the job. Um, how, in your experience, have you sort of helped your folks cope with sort of the having to shift their focus, shift their priorities, sometimes really dramatically, because we are kind of like this real-time incident response practice? To say, I'm going to call on either Catherine or Rolando first because I know law enforcement. That's something you've had to do. I've got, I've I've got many, many time. things to say, but I, I bet so... all of you have experience with this. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I, I, it's 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 just a resource requirement. So like, if you have come up through trust and safety, I think you have. You, if you, if you, if you've been successful, then you're going to have built flexibility and adaptability skills um, to 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 pivot to whatever situation you're facing, um, because they happen so frequently, right? So, um, and so we talked about that. If you've come up through the ranks, you're going to have some. You'll have built some of those skills. But for managers who don't have a trust and safety background, you still have to know how to adapt your management style. So you should have still some skills of being able to adapt and pivot and switch. Um, just as a person, and yes, adapting and pivoting and switching to, you know, January 6th versus a, another Robin Thicke video with nudity or whatever the situation may be today. That's an old reference from YouTube, but, you know, it's still relevant, still traumatizing. Um, uh, I think that you, you just have to st still pivot. And I think that just remembering that 
when you're building your OKRs or your goals, your annual planning, whatever it is that you're doing, um, as a leader or as an IC, you don't know what the specific issue is going to be, but you know that there's going to be a specific incident at some point in probably every quarter or every month or every holiday weekend. Um, and so just building that into the process so that you've got some, some flexibility, otherwise you're never going to get through anywhere near to all of the goals. Um, but also when you have got a real world incident, um, I alluded earlier to the fact that you may only have one or two minutes to actually make a decision and then you need to make it. But just you do generally have at least one or two minutes, breathe and think about what you actually want to do. You you have time to take that breath um, and to consult some people, maybe not everyone, um, but just that that's that's like how to pivot your, your leadership. I think you have to just go into firefighting mode, but then make sure that you also come out of it um, when it's when it's relevant. Rolando, did you have others to add? I mean, all great points, obviously. I, I think the key word there is adaptability, right? I think we all have to kind of roll with the punches as needed, um, especially in this line of work. Um, and yeah, kind of what Catherine was talking about, I, I'd say kind of deprioritizing other things, right? Just because you need to be able to possibly handle a certain escalation, right? So you know other work's going to be dropped and be okay with it. Um, and it's good to also cross train your team, right? Just because it, it will weigh on your team as well, right? If everyone's kind of focusing on this specific sensitive content, um, it's good to cross train individuals that way they can rotate and folks aren't like necessarily burnt out or, you know, it might be really uh, close to them, whatever the issue content they're reviewing is. So you might not want some of your team members to kind of be reviewing this content. Um, and that's why the cross training helps out where you can bring in others as needed to kind of deal with it. Um, but again, just kind of being okay with with change and and not maybe completing other tasks, other objectives at hand. Um, just kind of rolling with the punches ultimately, yeah. I'd say. And yeah. I guess my follow up here is like that sounds good for us as like individuals, right? Like, what's the hack if there is one? Like, to helping your team feel okay about that? Because I think all everyone on a trust and safety team, as individuals, understand like, all right, there's trade offs, and okay, it's unpredictable. But I think sometimes it can feel just like rolling the ball up the hill constantly. Where if like you as a team have these dreams or these objectives, and you feel like you're actually having to constantly step out of that to manage other things as they arise, which of course is the job. Um, you know, how do you keep your team kind of plugged in morale wise? How do you help them understand that's actually part of this process too? I can jump in really quick. So I think that uh, what I found in my experience, you know, as a people manager and also just being a team member who did go through this myself, is that follow through and that accountability is so important. So for example, if there's like a big project that we do have to deep prioritize because like a new escalation came in, I make sure to very visually show that this is still on the roadmap. We're moving it to this specific week. We will get to it. I put it in the agenda for, you know, whatever meetings are happening that week, just to make sure that like, we're not letting go of this. It's not falling between the cracks. And that also applies to, um, you know, some of the other kind of like individual things too. Sorry, lost my chain of thought, still recovering from COVID. So I'll blame the brain fog for that one. <laughs> it was still a great answer, actually. Yeah, it was. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think like the only thing I would add to that is like uh, you, 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 these Emerging issues are both exciting and kind of nerve wracking. You, you need to be decisive in the moment, as decisive as you can, as quickly as you can. And then I, I like to pivot into learning mode after we've sort of settled things down. Okay, what, what happened? What did we see? What could we have done differently? It's like this concept of the after action report in some way of, of taking lessons away from that and thinking about what, what changes with your process, what can you do to help the people on your on your team or adjacent to your team um, respond better, uh, prevent potentially or or mitigate in the future. Yeah, and to add to Paul's uh, comment as well, um, I think sharing those wins too with the team, right, definitely helps motivate individuals. Um, while they might be rare and few, I think even kind of the feedback we get, like obviously we work with law enforcement at times. Um, sometimes law enforcement will come back and say like, you know, you saved this person's life. Thank you so much for this information. Just sharing that with the team and yeah. showing that that real world impact they're having goes a long way, right? And continues to motivate individuals. And then kind of sharing that feedback higher up, right? With like the executive team, with senior leadership to show the value of these teams 
that acknowledgement piece, right, goes a long way as well to, for motivation for these individuals doing this work. Yeah. Great point. Well, I am going to transition this over to the audience Q&A because there's a lot of questions in here. Um, we're going to do our best to get through them. Um, we have the first question that was asked like from the beginning was, imagine you're back at, you know, sort of your company or like a, your, your first company as like the first trust and safety hire. What roles and functions do you hire first? And the, the questioner says, if you're at a social media startup, but not all of us are at social media startups. So sort of what do you think are those key first hires and why? And anyone can start on this if they have, there's, there's no set order here. I've only worked in big established teams already, so I don't know if I have a great answer for like like building it from scratch. Um, I think spam. I mean, you, you're going to see spam, you, copyright, like some of those some of those issues, and like some of the the initial legal stuff. You you need somebody to handle like any subpoenas or search warrants or whatever that you might get. Um, but I don't I'm sure somebody else has a better answer who's worked in smaller companies. I have a bit of a woo answer, but I think is a true answer as well, which is rather than a specific role or function, which I think really honestly does depend on the type of company you're at, yeah. um, what those goals are. Um, I think if you are hire number one, you're looking for a hire number two to be a thought partner to you. Um, you know, if typically if you're number one, you are doing the whole job and also are responsible for the strategy of the job. And two isn't actually that many more than one, even though you're doubling. And so you need someone who can actually be both of those things as well. They don't necessarily have to be the head of whatever. This is actually what I did at TSPA. As I came in, I was the only staff member. So I was like the director and also the person who wrote all the newsletters. And, you know, it was just, it was a lot. And I was able to hire Kao Fang Lee, our director of organizational development. And she really has a lot of the same capabilities as I do. Has a lot of strengths that I frankly don't have, uh, which is great. Um, but but it's someone I can go to to be that thought partner um, and who can also just get the work done. So that would be my answer there. Um, I'm actually going to move us to another question, um, which is around, uh, you know, how do you navigate the fact that trust and safety is uh, perhaps not a revenue generator, uh, which I think to some degree is a is a fallacy. I think we can talk about that, but um, I think it was commonly uh, uh, believed that trust and safety is just a huge cost center. Um, this person says, please share some of your tips on proving to your financial or accounting teams the positive impact of trust and safety when often what we prevent from happening is sometimes harder to track. I have to jump in. I know this is recorded. <laughs> Um, I think what's happened since November at Twitter is a great mm. thing to point to. Um, I'm going to stop talking about that now, though. Please, other people jump in. Um, I'll I'll take this second one just because I'm so passionate about this one. I have a lot of strong feelings, a lot of strong thoughts about this. Uh, so some of the things that I found really work are trust and safety is a growth lever. Um, it's something that leads to long-term retention. There's a lot of research, a lot of data out there that shows that people leave platforms, people leave apps because of toxic behavior, because of abuse. If someone experiences something bad, they're gonna leave. I'm sure Paul can speak a little bit more to that in terms of like, you know, safe and fair play on video games. But you know, on dating apps, on social media platforms, that is absolutely true as well. So I think that, you know, this is also something that, um, you know, I find very fun working with data science in. Sorry, I'll slow down and my excitement is showing, but the measurement of this area is tough. But I think that, you know, for, especially for those in kind of like the data science or engineering field, like. People really love those types of like meaty, really tough problems to try to solve. So one thing I've tried to do is like take an issue like spam, for example. You could probably find some kind of correlation between spam, the time people spend in the app or the time people spend on the platform and like the stickiness to it, and then the long-term retention. So being able to map out like, oh, like how many, how many, you know, like harmful incidents happen to this person? What is their threshold before they leave the platform? Do they ever come back? You know, do they leave forever? Do they go to another another peer? Those are one ways that I um, kind of approach it from a measurement perspective. And then also on the measurement side, there's there are kind of like complicated ways to try to size problems of being limited by what we do know and being able to measure that, but then adding some kind of multiplier be like, okay, well, let's assume we don't know, you know, like 20% of what else is happening on the platform. We can add that in as a buffer to try to size the problem. Uh, on the other side, uh, speaking more on the operation side too, I think that one thing that I found really successful is saying for every decision that someone in operations makes using the tool, that's also labeled data, uh, which can then feed into machine learning, which can then handle some of the simpler problems 
which allow people to handle the more nuanced, complicated things that machines just cannot solve because it requires that human eye. And so that's something that I've been able to pitch successfully to various finance teams over my career. Is like, well, instead of leveraging, you know, the third party machine learning labeling company or, you know, building our own labeling tool, our own labeling services, we can just use this already labeled data, labeled account, and use that to further kind of like multiply and accelerate our work. Um, Elsa. That's a great point. I think one of the things that I've absolutely seen happen over time is that as more automation, particularly good automation with with really good classifiers um, and preventative actions comes in, sometimes there's this expectation that, oh, we can shrink your team, right? We can shrink the budget because now we just have it managed magically. But what you're really doing is like you're taking the easy stuff away so that you have more capacity to look at the harder and more nuanced stuff. And that's just just really critical. Um, I think the other point I'd make is like when you're talking, because it is a not a revenue generator in general um, in this space, unless this is your business, right, um, is that you have to look at the halo effect uh, around those people that are impacted when you're talking about brand impact, when you're talking about the churn rates and, and the stickiness of your platform, people will show up because you have an amazing feature, an amazing product, or you've got some, um, you know, some uh, momentum in the marketplace, but they won't stay if they feel like they're getting picked on, harassed, they're seeing content that's not okay, and they don't feel like they have any power over that. So if you want people to stay, you have to make them feel like this is some place that like I get and I have control over my experience here. Um, and that that's kind of where you, I, I tend to lean into. And if I could just add from my side of the house, um, using the law too, right? Like obviously there's a lot of laws and regulations coming into our space that will impact um, trust and safety teams. Like we need folks to actually review this content. Um, so making that case, right? A lot of times there might be fines related to, to these new regulations, right? It's going to cost the company money. Um, also, do we really want to be blocked in this country, um, right? Like that's all part of the, the revenue and so forth. So um, I've utilized that to make the case for potential headcount um, and the importance of like trust and safety legal operations teams as well. That's a great sort of sideways answer to uh, another question we did have in the chat, which is like, well, it sounds like we're talking about content moderation, but like, what about like le legal operations? It's like, ah, good news. We got two people on here who like, that's uh, what they do is legal operations. And I think we are sort of uh, entering a world where we're going to see just a lot more similarity between those two types of teams where previously those were like, those are different, like the regulatory environment being what it is. Those are increasingly uh, the same. Um, we did have a question here uh, around mentorship. So coming back to an earlier part of the conversation, uh, this person asks, speaking of mentoring, how can you help newer people in the industry that are coming to you for advice and help? And I think this is like an especially relevant question now because of how like wacky and weird um, the jobs market is in trust and safety. Previously, I think you used to be able to say like, yeah, you just apply for a job. And now it's kind of like, well, um, how, you know, how, how would you answer this question or, you know, how can you help newer people who are coming to you for advice and help? What are what's some of the advice you're giving? What's some of the, the framing that you're giving them? Um, so I'm a program mentor, program sponsor. I don't remember my actual title for the Coffee Hours program that TSPA has. Um, and so I work closely with uh, a lot of the Coffee Hours ho coffee hour hosts um, who are providing their time to chat with members of TSPA and just the broader trust and safety community. Um, and they are, we are getting a lot of questions about how to break into the trust and safety space from academia or pro nonprofits or government or just how to find a job in this environment. Um, if you're struggling to find a job, please know that it is not just you. It is literally everyone it is the most tough job market I've ever seen. And I'm hearing that repeatedly from literally everyone. Um, so you're you're in great company. Um, but as far as helping people, go to the Coffee Hours page and see if there's anyone that um, that you want to talk to because they're they're have they're opening their time to to actually helping people. That's a specific thing. Some people will do resume reviews. Um, and I think just if people reach out to you, we trust and the people have asked in the past like what's one skill that you need to be in trust and safety. I don't think that there's one standard answer to that. 
But I do think that the skill or personality trait that most people in trust and safety have consistently is helpfulness. We like helping people. Um, and, and so they people will help if you reach out to them. Um, so like, don't be shy and, you know, you can um, hit me up on LinkedIn if you, if you need help and I'll help in whichever way I can with referrals or whatever it might be. Um, and that, that was less, that was more about job searching and general versus mentorship. But I think that, yeah, it, I think it probably covers a lot of that stuff. I have one other suggestion. These are all great, and and I'm not in the 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 uh, coffee hours chat thing, but I think that that's a great resource. The underhanded soft pitch that I'll hit is like go to these kinds of events. Like TSPA is an amazing resource. It's relatively new in the industry. It certainly wasn't around when uh, when I was coming in, and a lot of people were coming in. Two years and there's old. a hunger Can you for this. It? this opportunity to engage and connect and to learn so absolutely um you know joining organizations like this one attending seminars listening connecting talking to people yeah um the advice i used to give is twitter was fantastic for this but that's actually how i initially met Catherine. Um, because, you know, earlier on in my career, like I met so many trust and safety people and I would just tweet with them all the time. I learned a ton, did a lot of networking. I think that's how I met you too, Charlotte. But, uh, you know, I think LinkedIn is probably the best new alternative. And I quite literally direct everyone who asked me this question to the TSPA, uh, the curriculum, the library, the resources, everything is so helpful. Uh, and, you know, I think there's a really strong community here, you know, coffee hour, big plus one. And we'll put some resources for this in um, the sort of recording notes on YouTube when we upload that, because there are, I can see a bunch of questions in the chat about like, all right, but like, really, how do I get a job in trust and safety right now? And it is true. We do STSBA have a whole page for this. We do these events. We have coffee hours. Um, and so we, we've got uh, some stuff lined up to support everyone who is um, who is looking for a job right now, which is which is a lot of folks. Um, and, you know, Catherine's right that I'll just echo what she said. Uh, if you are looking for a job and you are not getting a job right now in trust and safety, um, that it, it's not about you. I mean, maybe it's about you or you look super weird. Great. So are we. That's actually a qualifier. Um, you know, it's it's just a hard time to to get a job. In DSA. DSA is coming. There will be more jobs. Like people are starting to figure it out, but it's literally yeah. required. Mm -hmm. There's going to be jobs, but it's it's just tough. Yeah. Yeah. And actually this goes to answer. We do have the latest question in here is, do you think it's worth sticking it out for roles in trust and safety in the current jobs market, even if you have good experience? And I think the short answer is, well, the short, the answer is, well, it depends on, you know, your personal situation and what you need to do and like, you know, make that money. But um, I share Catherine's view that we are going to see um, a pretty significant recovery in terms of numbers of roles, um, you know, being hired for over time because we're literally going to have to. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, Thank you, EU, your job creator. It's great. Um, we have five minutes left. And so I want to do just a quick lightning round. Um, I, to close out, would like to ask you, what is a mistake that you have either made yourself or you have seen made uh, by a leader? And what is the thing you have changed about the way you lead to make sure you do not make that mistake? And I know that's a bit that we could have an entire session on that, but could we just go around and just say, you know, sort of like what what is something you've changed about yourself um, or about the way you lead? Juliet, could we start with you? Yes, um, I will. My, my main answer is about taking time off. Uh, I think earlier in my career, I really thought was like, you know what, I got to set a model. I got to work all the time. I got to grind. Uh, no, you don't. You know what? Life is more important. Health is more important. Emotional wellness is more important. And as a leader now, like I take generous amounts of time off. I encourage my team to do so all the time. I think it's really important. People are better when they feel better. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I'm off. Yeah. Rolando, what about you? All about that work-life balance, Juliet. Um, yeah, for me, it'd be kind of giving positive feedback. I think as leaders and managers, we tend to obviously focus on constructive feedback mm -hmm. um, to definitely help our folks. But, you know, sh sharing positive feedback um, definitely helps kind of motivate individuals and and keeps kind of morale up as well. So definitely remembering to share positive feedback on, on a regular and in real time. Yeah. Paul, how about you? I, I think for me, it's actually been the other way around. It's been more about being better, about giving constructive and even critical um, performance feedback. I tend to be 
more of a relationship builder. I tend to be empathetic. And as a leader, those can be really, really helpful. But if you're not self-aware and you're not managing that tendency to want to help somebody, um, you can actually get in the way of their progress and their development and delivery of their goals as well as your team's goals. So um, for me, it's been about being better at um, providing constructive and critical feedback too. I want to do like a whole session about how do you do performance management for teams where it's like, can I honestly ask them to do one more thing, right? I mean, like, gosh, right? Um, there's like this emotional component to it, I think, especially in trust and safety, that it's, it's hard for a lot of managers. Um, Catherine, let's, uh, let's ask you. Um, I think the thing that's probably changed is just um, as I've become more senior, I feel like people see me as a title and not as a human. Um, and I'm still a human. I'm really quite human, I think. Um, and so I actually talk to them directly about how I think I'm approachable. Um, and I also try and back it up um, and just try and be authentic and stuff because I, like, I'm just a person. Yes, I have a title or whatever, and I've got more experience, but um, and just trying to bring that levity to the work we do like I know that sometimes in trust and safety we are literally saving lives but at some point it's just a website it's just like it's just, so trying to have some perspective that I definitely feel I have over the years I've, I've got more and more of that so just trying to sort of instill that with with people um that's it's, I, I don't know if it's a mistake as such but it's definitely something I've developed over over the years yeah well, I want to say thank you to each of you for taking the time to answer these questions, to just be in conversation with each other. Um, I was really looking forward to this session because I feel like I still have so much to learn from people like you. And so it's it's selfishly a wonderful time. Um, and thank you to our audience for submitting such great questions. I was optimistic. I was like, we'll try to get to them all. There's like still nine questions in this chat. So um, we're going to do our best to do with some follow up here. Um, if you are uh, you know, here live or if you're watching the recording later and thinking like, oh, TSPA, this was like, this was relevant content to me. Um, I have great news for you. We have an entire organization devoted to this sort of content. Um, if you go to tspa.org, you'll be able to learn more about what we do, um, who our members are, you can become a member. Um, wanted to highlight there's two events coming up uh, that might be relevant to you if you are a practitioner in trust and safety. Um, one is that we're doing our first ever regional summit. Uh, we're doing an EMEA regional summit in Dublin, uh, May 31st. So we're coming to Ireland and we hope that you will too if you are based in Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um, you can find more information about that on our website. If you go to tspa.org, you go to the conferences uh, tab and then you hit EMEA summit 2023. Uh, you can also, I think, go to summit summits summit.tspa.org, but I'm, you know, we'll, we'll make a link. Um, the other thing that's coming up, uh, oh, sorry, EMEA Summit, uh, that is free if you're a member. So if you are a TSPA member, you come on down. There is a cost if you are not a member, but you could apply to be a member and then you save money. See how this goes. Um, the big thing, uh, of course, that we do every year is TrustCon. Uh, TrustCon is this year a three-day conference. Um, it's going to be in San Francisco, July 11th through 13th. Uh, registration is now open. And I want to make sure you all know, uh, registration's open. The, the cost is published. And if you can pay full price this year, of course, we want you to do that because that allows us to give free admission to some people who really need it. So there is uh, substantial financial assistance this year for folks who are between jobs, who uh, maybe are, you know, they, they are employed, but their boss is like, travel, are you serious? Forget it, right? Um, we put a lot of work into making sure that TrustCon is still a place for our community, regardless of, you know, what it needs to cost to be able to put on a three-day conference. So if you go to trustcon.net, you'll see that registration information. And if you click on the registration fees section, there is a place to apply for financial assistance. So do not do not rule yourself out of TrustCon this year. We hope we see you there. Um, We'll be uh, putting some links uh, into our uh, notes around uh, the coffee hours program, the resources we have for job seekers. Um, so with that, thank you again to our wonderful panelists and uh, we'll see you around. Stay safe out there. Thank you.